Dan Sinopoli of SUNY ESI. Hey guys, <clears throat> good morning. Uh, thank you guys for still braving out the weather to be here. I know a bunch of people already left early between the snowstorm and then the ice storm and the other snowstorm. So uh, thanks for being here this morning. Uh, so this is uh, going to be kind of this is kind of one half of my finished master's thesis I finished back in December, talking about um, morphology and taxonomy of bowfins, um, not in New York State but in the Mississippi River Basin. Um, if any of you guys were here last year, um, I kind of gave a post on the second half, which was all kind of management regulation stuff. Um, so looking at uh, the genus Amia, which currently right now has only one species, Amia calva, the bowfin. Um, they're mostly lowland. Uh, they have somewhat limited migration capacity. In some instances, they'll go kind of across a lake, or in other instances, they may make a slightly longer uh, migration than most bowfins do. But you find them in almost any lowland aquatic habitat you might imagine, swamps, lakes, rivers, bayous. Um, they exhibit a surprising amount of parental behavior for a fish that's considered so primitive. Um, the males will uh, build the nest and they'll guard the eggs and they'll guard the young for a while after they hatch. Um, and so their biology seems to favor this uh, allopatric divergence where they're not really moving around too much, they're inhabiting a lot of these different habitats, so there may be the potential for um, divergence or separation or speciation, but why is it only considered one species right now? So as it turns out, there were actually 13 uh, extant species of bovin described prior to 1896. Um, the first species, Amia calva, was described down in South Carolina. The second and third, a silicon and oxen and are both from the Great Lakes, Lake Huron. Uh, and then almost, uh, almost half of them were described just from the Mississippi River Basin. Uh, and while those fish, while these species were being described, there were multiple attempts at trying to lump them back together for really, with no real analysis whatsoever. They, these guys, Gunter and Jordan Everman, just kind of thought, well, no one really cares about bowfins, so maybe if we just lump it together, it's easier. Um, so Gunther tried in 1870, um, wasn't talking to um, some of these other taxonomists who were still describing both and while he was trying to lump them all together. So that was kind of largely ignored, but then the final nail in the coffin was Jordan Everman in 1896. Uh, they were putting together this big multi-volume set of all the fishes in North and Middle America, and when they got to bowfins, they just said, all right, it's Amia calva with 12 synonyms, effectively rendering the other 12 names here the same uh, synonyms of Amia calva, so everything is there for one species. Um, and they really did it with no analysis, and I'm, I'm not kidding when I say that. Like, they didn't check any of the holotype specimens of any of those species. They didn't talk to any of the taxonomists that described them. Most of the taxonomists were in Great Britain or France, and these guys were American, and they yet didn't really, they didn't really make a good attempt at um, trying to justify their decision. Uh, but since then, there haven't been any subsequent papers on uh, at least living both in taxonomy uh, in the past 120 years at least. I think it's been 120 years. Um, there have been a couple fossil amia described, but they're all out west in like Montana and Utah. Uh, and the real uh, concern that uh, lumping all these fish together, all these species together, has is uh, the uh, establishment and spread of a bowfin caviar fishery. Um, yes, bowfin caviar is a thing. Um, it is um, largely, it was largely used in the beginning as an alternative for sturgeon and paddlefish caviar. Um, that was how people kind of figured out it was so good. So it was illegally putting in bowfin and mixing it in with sturgeon because it looked so similar and then they got caught. Uh, but then they were like, all right, let's just sell this wholesale. Uh, we'll just sell it as bowfin and people don't mind. Um, so as this uh, continues to spread, um, with the current market value of caviar, um, you can get up to $330 a kilo for some of this caviar, so that means a large adult female can be over $100 worth in value. And how do you protect something that's worth that much? Um, and there's a lot of unrecognized diversity that may be threatened 
uh, because of that, especially since the caviar fishery right now is centered in uh, Louisiana, the Gulf area, and that's where a lot of those species were originally described. Well, a lot of them were described in the lower Mississippi River Basin, so if that diversity does exist, then that could be a huge problem. So uh, the objectives of my study were to test the monotypy hypothesis that Jordan and Everman essentially created when they said, okay, Amia is a monotypic genus, it has one species in it. Uh, just, we're testing it just for uh, the Mississippi River Basin. I mean, look, we, we cut it down to the whole Mississippi River Basin. Uh, and, as well as uh, adjacent Lake Pontchartrain, it's just outside the basin. Uh, but since it was right there and there were specimens available, we decided to throw that in as well. Um, and this is really just a broad survey of the variation in morphology that may warrant further, um, further morph morphological analyses in the future, as well as um, genetic uh, studies as well using DD RADSEC. Um, a lot of the genetic stuff is really not in my wheelhouse. Um, a lot of my morphology stuff is going to kind of get thrown in when the genetics are finished and hopefully put into a publication. So there were six nominal species described from the Mississippi River Basin or near New Orleans. Um, and so we're gonna be trying to see if we can maybe parse some of these species out or even find any possible variation in that area to begin with. So fresh samples were taken uh, at or near the type localities of some of these species. So we have uh, two localities from the type locality for Amia calva, which is Charleston, South Carolina. Amia silicata, the type locality is Georgian Bay, so we have a sample from there. Uh, we have a couple fish from Iowa that were uh, museum pieces. Fresh specimens from the Wabash and Ohio rivers, which were a type locality for Amia reticulata. And then down in the Mississippi River Basin, in the lower Mississippi, we have um, the type locality for Amia marmorata uh, with that adjacent Lake Pontchartrain and the Baratarian Basin. Uh, and I'll get to these subgroups later on. There was a reason we split those up. Um, and so the morphometric data was for 40 characters and then eight meristic characters were taken on every single specimen. We used a cluster analysis to uh, we, we applied a cluster analysis to those two Louisiana sites um, using a <coughs> method uh, with Euclidean distance as the similarity matrix. Because um, originally it was looking like there may be some variation within both of those populations, so we wanted to see if that would reflect out in a cluster analysis. Uh, we used analyses of covariance on the individual morphometric traits using bivariate plots to determine the diagnostic characters. And um, so that ended up being 21 pairwise comparisons for each character. So 21 times 40 is a lot of analyses of covariance uh, that I do. And we ended up not, we started trying to uh, use uh, PCAs with ratio data, but then we figured out later on that there may be some complications with compound variance using ratio data. So the analyses of covariance are actually with raw data. And when I was kind of switching over from ratio data to raw data using the, the analyses of covariance, more often than not, the tests that were uh, coming out significant were still significant afterwards, after the switch. So it didn't have too much of an impact, but it also got rid of potential uh, statistical complications. And then uh, we used the two tailed Man Whitney U test for the between population median differences for the meristics, and all this was done in the past. So this is the cluster analysis uh, for Lake Pontchartrain and for the Barataria Basin, and you can see here that they split out really nicely, two subgroups in uh, both localities, and Lake Pontchartrain was interesting in particular because we are actually able to sex all of those fish, and it was a 50-50 sex ratio within both groups. So it wasn't as simple as one group being all male, one group being all female, which let alone would have been interesting for both fins to have that much sexual dimorphism in their morphology. But the fact that it's evenly distributed and it's evenly spread out between the two sexes means that it's more than that. 
and this is the first evidence that we have for possible sympatry in bowfins, which you can't have sympatry if it's only one species. So um, that was, yeah, very interesting. And then this is um, a nice big table showing all of the different significant characters, just the number of significant characters for each of those pairwise comparisons. So the number of marista counts that were significant from the man waiting you test CERN red, and the number of significant char morphometric characters from the analyses of covariance are in black. Uh, so it was all to P uh, less than 0.05. Uh, and what was very interesting was we had kind of this lump of, uh, this grouping of uh, kind of three different populations, or two different populations, the Wabash and Ohio River, and then that second Barataria subgroup early on actually kind of fell in with each other, um, which was interesting. And then also, when compared to the type specimen, or the type locality of uh, Amy Calvin from South Carolina, it also didn't really shake out the way we were expecting it to. It all kind of lumped together, and um, we were confused on that. So here is a good comparison showing uh, Bofin from the type locality of Amia Calva, the first species, and Amia Silicata, the second species of so South Carolina versus Georgia Bay and Lake Huron. You can see just color-wise, they're strikingly different. And then looking at the actual diagnostic characters, um, the width of the mandibles behind the gular plate, so back behind the jaw, uh, the diameter of the posterior nostril actually was one of the characters for a lot of the comparisons that was considered pretty diagnostic. The bowfins from the type locality of Amia calva have like a very, very tiny pinhole nostril, whereas um, the Lake Huron fishes have a much larger posterior nostril, noticeably different. Um, the head length is also different, and the prepectoral distance is also different, so it's uh, head length and head width that are different between these two populations. And there was actually two more that I had to put on a different slide because it wasn't room. Uh, so pelvic fin length also, and also the uh, longest dorsal fin ray. So in Emia silicata type specimens, the uh, dorsal fin was higher. So the taxonomic implications of all this, um, I reject the monotypic hypothesis for both fins in the Mississippi River Basin. Uh, it seemed that there were five distinct morphotypes within that study area, but that needs further verification with actual genetic evidence. The sympatric morphotypes at those two lower Mississippi Basin sites, the Lake Pontchartrain and Barataria Estuary, suggest that those differences are not simply just ecotip variation. There's something further that we need to really dig into down there. Uh, there was varying levels of morphological similarity between the Wabash and Ohio River specimens and the topotypes types of Amia calva and Amia silicata. So that actually might suggest that since Wabash and Ohio rivers are kind of at the lower end of the Great Lakes, upper end of the Mississippi, it may be some weird mixing zone uh, between those two biogeographic areas that were, are historically cut off, but with the creation of canals and shipping lanes and channelization, it may uh, allow those two biogeographic areas to mix more. Uh, so, and that Wabash and Ohio River did have a closer resemblance to Amia calva than it did to Amia silicata. So I propose a new hypothesis that that upper Mississippi Basin area could be some intergrade between those two nominal species because it seems pretty evident um, and spoiled where we do have some preliminary genetic work on this. The Great Lakes and South Carolina split out very, very far from each other. So it seems like the genetics back up the morphology really well. Uh, the Upper Mississippi River Basin also acts as a hybrid zone for GARS already. So GARS being within that same cystic group of Tilias as Bofin are, uh, you might expect that Bofin follow that same pattern of diversity. Uh, the Wabash and Ohio River localities in Lower Illinois also represent a potential refugia during uh, the last glaciation. The glaciers didn't make it that far 
didn't were like at the doorstep of the Wabash and Ohio rivers. So that would have been a place where bowfins and gars could have held over during the last glacial maximum. And there's also all these man-made canals that, um, again, may in, uh, allow for mixing to occur between all these, uh, between those two biogeographic areas. But again, genetic testing needs to be done to really confirm that hypothesis, whether it's a hybrid zone or an intergrade zone or what. Um, there are a lot of taxonomic complexities that still remain related to poor preservation of any extant type specimens, and there's actually five taxa that are just missing specimens entirely. This is an example of poor preservation. This is Amia pequetii from 1870. Uh, this is actually a sin type, so there were two type specimen genes that described this species, but it looks like they just kind of stuffed it and didn't really do much with it afterwards. Uh, we do have some topotypes now in hand for four of those taxa that are missing holotypes uh, that can provide neotypes, population samples. We do a lot of skeleton work too to look at osteology, uh, as well as the tissue samples that can be used for further genetic analysis. Um, we're still looking for the holotype of Ania beardis, which is down in, supposedly it's down in New Orleans, because um, that one also lacks a holotype. It, Ania beardis, the green bowfin, and it, if you've seen a lot of bowfin, you know a lot of them, a lot of them can be green. So it's got to be a really, really green bowfin that we got to look for. <laughs> so the implications again of all this for on the conservation end, um, the caviar harvests are increasing, uh, not only in the amount that are being t that's being taken, but also the number of states that are beginning to participate in bowfin caviar fisheries. Uh, so that could lead to a possible overharvest of wild populations. Um, if the demand gets so high that they start needing to create these aquaculture setups for bowfins, um, I've never heard of an aquaculture setup that has that doesn't have an escapee at some point or some disease come out at some point when things escape. So you may get hybridization or disease transfer, and then along with a lot of the other fishes that we've talked about today this, or just at this meeting, uh, habitat loss, climate change, uh, exotic introductions are all a big threat to these fish. Um, and so there's a lot of unrecognized diversity that could be at threat. Uh, so it's really important that we understand that diversity, whether it's multiple species or evolutionary significant units, whatever we call it, we need to figure out what it is before we start losing these fish before we ever know what they are. And I have a lot of people to thank. There's my major professor, Don Stewart, looking really happy with the bowfin from Alabama. Uh, big thanks to my steering committee and all the past students that kind of helped pave the way for this project. And that's the type specimen for Amy and Cal, or that's what I have to work with. But it's just a skull and a skin taped to a piece of paper. And with that, I'll take any questions. <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, my advisor Don Stewart uh, did do a couple x-rays on some of those holotype specimens. Some of those museums are kind of like worried about people handling their specimens. This one is in the Linnaean Society Museum because it was described by Linnaeus, so they were very, very, they were almost kind of stingy with how much they let him work with it. He was able to get some measurements and kind of not much else, especially when it's just really the head is the only, that's the only skeleton that's left besides the fin rays as well. But it's like, the, we, we are looking at osteology and x-rays. Um, it's a lot of data that we have yet to really work on, but it is definitely something we're hoping to look into. One more question. Uh, is there any evidence of uh, different, uh, you know, for like any different ecological niches or any any differences in soil morphology that might suggest uh, different, different uh, creative types? So um, we haven't looked too much into actual ecological niches. Um, we, one count that we, one mercy count that we do try to do as much as we can, it's tough on the um, freshly collected preserved specimens, is um, gill raker counts. 
So what, counting the number of gill rakers, seeing if there's differences in size or shape that may indicate difference in diet. Um, but bowfins are kind of criminally understudied, so it would be tough to really make a claim right now as far as any ecological differences. That, those ecological differences, if they do exist, may explain the diversity. All right, let's, yeah. yep, we are going to have now a 20 minute break. Let's give Dan a last round of applause. <laughs> and we'll start again at 10.10 for the last of the morning session. Hey, great job. Thanks. Thanks. Sorry. Um, so, my question was, so why do you think the national is safe? Well, it's like when it out into the ground, they kind of like take water to some of my notes from the theology class. And we have a slide of lakes and stuff. In May, and again, it's like it's really bizarre. And it's almost like you don't know what to talk about. So they were not types. He has. Someone collected them in the 1920s. Really? Don Tatum was teaching collections. Really? Because yeah. that's how I learned uh, ichthyology on them. I was just looking back at my notes. And I went down and told them, I was like, Don, these are like, I'm about to write a paper with them on it. They think there's two more. Yeah, they could also skin more. Yeah, from one night. Yeah, so I got to. Because it hurts me. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Someone had a special. Yeah. So I got to talk to them. So I was like, talk to Randy about it. We just finished. They just finished. They're picking up on it. Once I expressed interest, I was like, Oh, you're right. Yeah. Kids have been oh, sure. Oh, yeah. They've been poking out of the museum collection. Easy peasy, yeah. They don't. He doesn't have any of their blood or sculpt to support them. Promote items. I don't think so. He's got a whole jar of sculpt. Yeah. 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 Yeah.